Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, almost Chag Sameach, almost happy Hanukkah. Uh, delighted that you're with us. And uh, we are going to study Pirkei Avot this morning. As always, uh, a little friendly announcement that if your camera is on and your microphone is on, you stand the chance of being uploaded to the internet later today. So just take that under advisement. Um, but I am recording the class for the benefit of those who uh, either cannot join us or would like to watch the lesson again, or happen to have a bad case of Hanukkah insomnia. This is a great remedy. Um, let's begin with a bracha, a blessing for the study of Torah. Baruch ata Aronai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Um, so we are, uh, my aspiration is that we would complete chapter one of Pirkei Avot, which would be a nice way of kind of providing a little bit of a closure before our winter hiatus, um, which will be prompted by the upcoming holiday season, followed by a three month sabbatical that I will be uh, enjoying uh, between January and March, and then to resume um, a week after Pesach. Um, so to resume kind of like early mid-April, I think it'll probably be mid-April, and then have a six or seven week course of study that takes us all the way, all the way to Shavuot, at which point, uh, of course, periodically we'll be reassessing the state of the world, and uh, particularly with the restrictions that the temple has thoughtfully put in place to keep us safe during the pandemic. I, I know that those considerations are under kind of regular reevaluation. So I'm sure that given the course of the pandemic and vaccination, we should be able to have a reassessment come spring about the timeline for reopening for in-person business. Just to assuage any potential anxieties around this question, it's my belief and certainly my intention that uh, for I guess one could say the conceivable future, uh, we will have to be planning for a hybridization of in-person and online engagement, which means that even if and when we reassemble in person, um, it, it's important that we reach our congregation via the internet as well. Uh, so we can use streaming from the building and not just from my home. Um, but this has proved to be a, I would say, more than adequate way of engaging in Jewish learning. And I really applaud and appreciate your commitment to regular study. It's been wonderful for me. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I promise that the temple will not be, uh, you know, just going offline for three months while I'm on sabbatical. But quite the contrary, if anything, my colleagues are doubling down on the engagement and learning that they will be offering. So please, just pay close attention to the weekly electronic newsletter, which comes out Thursday morning. It was sent about an hour ago, as well as uh, to the website and the printed bulletin, which is probably your least reliable source of information these days because we do the bulletin so many months in advance. And these days we're not able to plan many months in advance. So a lot of the programming that the temple is offering is actually being put on the calendar too soon to be registered in the printed bulletin, but is certainly going to be reflected on the, the weekly uh, e-blast. So uh, just if you pay attention to our communications, I promise you, you won't miss out on all the wonderful offerings from the temple. Um, and be good to my colleagues. They're gonna be working very hard to take care of you and our fellow congregants during the pandemic, uh, during the winter uh, months while I'm on sabbatical. Um, just be gentle with them. Know how hard they're working and how sincerely they have dedicated themselves to serving the Jewish people. So just be nice. <laughs> okay, that's my that's my disclaimer. Why don't we um, uh, why don't we dive right in, having uh, offered our blessing for study. Um, the text that we are going to pick up with is exactly where we left off. Um, we've been examining pairs of pre-rabbinic scholars. Uh, or teachers, probably more at teachers, um, who are recorded in the first chapter of Pirkei Avot as part of a direct uh, linear transmission of Jewish tradition, uh, one generation to the next, uh, one pair of teachers typically to the next pair. That pattern continues until we hit uh, the pair that we're going to spend a little bit more time on today, 
which are probably the most celebrated of the uh, scholars, that is Hillel and Shammai, who uh, were around during the reign of Herod. Um, we talked a little bit about just some rabbinic or pre-rabbinic geopolitics last time, and I'll just refresh your memory that after the Hasmonean conquest, that is to say the victory of the Maccabees that we will begin to celebrate tonight at sundown and over the next eight days, the uh, family uh, of the Maccabees set up a, a kind of a theo theocratic dynasty um, in the biblical land of Israel um, that was even in its own day and certainly in the post-Maccabean rabbinic frame uh, controversial. Um, the, I think the dominant Jewish view is that the Maccabean conquest started off with the most noble of intentions, which was to restore Jewish sovereignty and wrest uh, political control away from the Syrian Greeks and from the influence of the Hellenistic empires and return Eretz Yisrael to Jewish control. Um, but like so many noble aspirations over time, over the century that followed the Maccabean conquest, uh, those that, no, that nobility of design was viewed to have been corrupted by the kind of raw political machinations of the Hasmoneans. Um, and the, the dominant view of later Jewish tradition is that the, the Hasmonean dynasty was a particularly corrupt uh, time in Jewish history. It was not particularly long-lived. It was a dynasty of about 100 years time, and uh, it was overthrown by the Roman Empire. Um, and then for the better part of the second half of the first century BCE, all the way up until the year 70 of the Common Era, uh, and a little bit after, uh, Judea, the formerly independent Jewish province was uh, ruled as a proxy state uh, in one corner of the Roman Empire. And it was basically governed by a Roman appointed procurator, which is a term for a governor, um, who was a direct appointee of the crown. Um, and some of these procurators' names are known to you. Herod is one of the most famous. Another one you probably know, if you know even a little bit of Christian tradition or Christian history, is Pontius Pilate. He was the local Roman appointed governor in Judea. Um, so we talked about these folks last time, and that just gives us a little bit of the time frame and the milieu in which these proto rabbis are teaching and transmitting the oral law which will later then be written down and codified in the Mishnah by the first half of the third century CE. So I hope that this historical framework provides you with just a little bit of context for understanding what exactly these rabbis or these proto rabbis were, were doing and when. Um, so here we go, Hillel and Shammai. Uh, we, we ended last week's lesson on Mishnah 12, chapter 1. Hillel and Shammai received the oral tradition from them, their predecessors, who were Shemaiah and Avtalion. Somebody uh, registered with me after class a very thoughtful, I thought provocative comment that in a sense, um, maybe the, there's a, a way, even as the, I, I kind of use Shemaiah and Avtalion, who in Jewish tradition are noteworthy converts, um, as a kind of a, a plaudit, like, oh, look, isn't it nice that these converts have a place of honor among the other teachers? And one of you uh, class participants sent me an email saying, actually, maybe it's kind of obnoxious that the tradition paired the two converts with each other, as if to say, well, converts should go with converts and the rest of the Jewish people <laughs> get to be you know, full-born, uh, purebred Jews. I'm not sure that that was the intention of the text, but it was a noteworthy observation, and I appreciate the close reading that, that led to it. Um, nevertheless, Hillel and Shammai, the most famous of the pairs of teachers in Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, verse 13, or section 13. Uh, this is Hillel. Um, Hillel gets a lot of uh, the, uh, I would, the kind of like the, the leading position among the, the teachers here. Hu uh, haya Omer, he used to say, Nagej, oh, and, and by the way, the language is now going to flip in between uh, Hebrew and Aramaic. So if you're familiar with the kind of general pronunciation and cadence of Hebrew, 
um, you might recognize that this passage sounds a bit foreign um, because it's not Hebrew, it's actually Aramaic. Hu haya omer is Hebrew. He, he used to say, but then when we get to the part that should be in quotation marks, the thing that Hillel said, it flips to Aramaic. Now it's hard to see that if you're not a, a, a conversant in Aramaic because Aramaic is written in the same characters as we write modern day Hebrew. Um, nevertheless, it's Aramaic. Naged Shema Aved Shemeh. Naged Shema Aved Shemeh means one who makes his name great, one who aggrandizes oneself. Aved causes to perish Shemei, his name. In Hebrew, Shemei would be Shemo. Um, they're, they're very similar. Aramaic and Hebrew are basically cognate languages. Aramaic was the vernacular of these teachers at the time in the century before, during, after the time that Jesus walked the earth. It's almost certain that Jesus's own vernacular language was Aramaic. If Shemei sounds familiar, it's because you know it from other Aramaic prayers like the Kaddish. Uh, Yit Gadal v'yit Kadash Shemei Rabbah. May God's name be magnified and sanctified. Shemei, his name. Hebrew, it would be Shemo. Like Ushemo, Ushemo, Ushemo Echad at the end of the Alenu prayer. And God's name shall be one. All right. One who aggrandizes his name, makes his name great, Aved Shemei. His name will perish. Udelo Mosif Yasef. There's, there's a real poetry to the language here too. And one who does not add decreases, or uh, uh, I would say falls away or withers, is yasef, dries up. So udelo mosif, if one does not add, it dries up or falls away. We can talk about what that means. Udelo yalef ketala chayav. And one who does not study, in this case, obviously Torah, is deserving uh, of death. We can talk about whether that is to be taken literally or not. And finally, and one who engages unworthily uh, in the crown of learning shall fly away, shall just vanish. So the, the tra that's my own translation. You have a perfectly uh, good translation from Sepharia here as well. He, Hillel, also used to say, one who makes his name great causes his name to be destroyed. One who does not add to his knowledge causes it to cease. And one, one who does not study the Torah deserves death. And one who makes unworthy use of the crown, we can talk about what crown, they, they give you the answer here, shall pass away. It's actually unusually a fourfold teaching, not a threefold maxim. Um, and I'd love for anyone, I'm going to leave it on the screen, which means I can't see your hand. So if you want to speak, just unmute yourself kindly um, and comment. What do you think Hillel is driving at here? What, what is this text really all about? Think about some of the things we've talked about. Who is the audience for these texts? What's Hillel trying to get across? Well, if I may. Please, Russell. Uh, I, well, I think the audience is other learned people, uh, uh, perhaps other rabbinical students. But I think he's in the theme that unites it all is humility. Uh, humility in the face of learning, humility in the face of fellow man. And I actually think that the admonition not to abuse one's learning is actually quite beautiful. Um. Great. Um, I, I think there's a, a yes, I think, I think that's a, a, an elegant and, and eloquent compact summary of what's really going on here. Um, the rabbis are not only interested in the preservation of this treasured tradition, they are also interested in cultivating a learned class and a teaching class um, from among the Jewish people who will be faithful transmitters of that tradition. And that requires more than um, a kind of mastery of the material, right? There's a lot in these texts that we're gonna be looking at today that are as much about the character of the teacher as about his 
learning. It would always be a he, which is why I'm okay making this a gender specific comment. Um, and so uh, the humility of the teacher is inculcated to disciple rabbis in training or teachers in training at a very young age and throughout. Um, and, and the idea I think is that, you know, your learning should also go in tandem with your character development and, and that one is necessary for the other. Um, and specifically a humble bearing is essential for the transmission of this particular tradition of learning. Uh, and look, I think we've all had teachers who were uh, inspiring uh, because they were conduits of the material in a, I think, a loving and faithful way. And we've also probably had teachers who were obnoxious to us or uh, difficult because uh, one comes away from the impression when being in their presence that it's really all about them and not about the learning. Um, I think I saw my dad's hand up. Just briefly, it's uh, something that could be in a, in a student handbook, students co students code of conduct. Yeah, which actually, I don't think it could be, I think this is it. I think that that's exactly what Pirkei Avot is, at least chapter one. Remember, this is a six chapter book, it might have been originally five with a, an appendix. Uh, but chapter one seems to be the kind of master handbook for the people who will teach. Uh, and then after Pesach, when we get into chapters two and three, we can see the ways in which chapter one serves as a, uh, a thoughtful manual for the, for the attributes of the teacher. Okay, let's move on then. Um, now we come to Hillel's almost undoubtedly his most famous, most celebrated uh, teaching. Um, I have this uh, in my office as a beautiful framed paper cut um, work of Hebraic text art. Hu haya omer, he used to say, and now we're back to Hebrew, by the way, so it's, it's unclear whether or not Hillel was simply bilingual or, and that his, his teachings were recorded in both Hebrew and Aramaic, or if original teachings were translated into Aramaic for the benefit of an Aramaic speaking audience, not clear to me. Um, nevertheless, back to Hebrew, Hu haya omer, he used to say, im ein ani li mili, if I am not from myself, who shall be for me? And if I am for myself, or when I am for myself, here they have, but if I am for myself, my own self only, I, I don't love that translation, but if I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? Okay, a classic Pirkei Avot threefold aphorism. Um, Hillel's most famous teaching, but what does it mean exactly? And this one, I don't need to keep the screen up. We can go to gallery view or whatever we like, because I think this one is fairly well internalized among this learned crowd of Jewish uh, students. So Hillel used to say, if I am not for myself, who is for me? But if I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? Um, but this one is not directly about teaching, by the way. So what is... Help me unpack this one. I'd love to see and hear what you see and hear in this text. And I might add, by the way, while you're ruminating, um, surely most of you have heard this before. Does your familiarity with Mishnah and the context of Pirkei Avot do anything to shape or change or modify how you now think about this teaching from Hillel? It, it doesn't have to be yes. I think it, I think the context, though, could be helpful in understanding what Hillel is driving at. Just, uh, just unmute yourself and start speaking. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I usually go to the bigger picture of the society, either information or one that has to be rebuilt, there's always, whether you teach in a classroom today in the Bronx, or whether you teach a Hillel, that there has to be in their mind more than just a transmission of the tradition of other rabbis. It, there has to be an end objective. And, and what comes to my mind, and I'm, completely 
part of that. I've witnessed since I've come to this country, a slow but steady transformation of Jewish learning and synagogue life from what I knew, and maybe even in the mid 1960s as practiced by Rabbi Wall, was he, Judy? Yeah, okay, reform. From, a, you know, sort of like rigid reform, this is what we do, to much more inclusive to the point that we are now singing prayers, um, addressing much more that is common to all aspects of Judaism, though we do it in our own way because we don't sing in a synagogue. So I just have to believe that if not, if not I, for whom? Well, it is for, for, for everybody that Hillel addresses in terms of the desire and continued even today, the most, you know, the most uh, uh, present of the, the Hillel societies at universities is not an accident to me. That's, they, there is a, a, a direct involvement that attempts to shape society, call it the geopolitical present society, to what Judaism or the rabbis of, of, of that time and today intend to communicate. Thank you so much. That was, um, I think, beautifully and personally framed. And I would add to it, one of the things I hear in your comment is, is and I, I, it resonates with me, uh, that there has been a shift in at least Reform Judaism from a more particularistic to a more universalistic outlook, so that you can apply this statement both at the individual level, if I am not for myself, you know, I, the individual, who shall be for me? If I am for myself alone, what am I? I versus the other. But it's also about the Jewish collective versus the universal human collective, right? How much should our Judaism be principally concerned with Jewish affairs? And how much should Judaism be uh, about the inclusive outlook that embraces all of humankind? And that's a dialectic that I think I'm constantly trying to balance in my rabbinate and in the mission of Westchester Reform Temple, which is both universalistic and particularistic. And we are a synagogue. We're not just any other social service agency or social justice advocacy organization. We are specifically a place where Jewish people gather to experience the rhythms of Jewish life, the music of Jewish life, the prayer of Jewish life, the language and learning of Jewish life. But we are also an organization that cares uh, when there are, you know, uh, refugees dying in the farthest corners of the world who, other than the fact of a shared humanity, have nothing else to do with Judaism. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's a both and. And Hillel's opening two statements, uh, with the third being a fascinating coda, do speak to that dialectic, that, that, um, that, um, constant mediation between the self-interest or the interest of the particular in the case of groups and group identity and collective interest. Uh, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, Alan and then Russell, please. Uh, yeah, I, I, you kind of hit upon my, my thoughts. You know, if, if I am not for myself, it's not myself as uh, Alan Markowitz is myself as a member of the Jewish community at large. Years ago, we had a, uh, a day of learning at Westchester Reform Temple with a lot of breakout rooms. And uh, I, I selected one breakout, it was run by Jan, a Rabbi Katsu. And uh, he went around the room asking people who they make donations to. And this one member was clearly from the old classical reform Jewish tradition said that she only makes donations to non-Jewish organizations and causes. And when pressed on that, she said that uh, she wants to indicate that she is a member of the world at large. So that was very telling uh, because it, it goes really against this uh, Hillel thing uh, where you need a, a balance. Thank you. 
I remember that class. And of course, I, I have many fond memories of that, believe it or not, seven years that we had an annual Yom Limud or Day of Learning. That was a, actually a vision that I brought to WRT. And I'm grateful that Rabbi Jacobs was so supportive of the idea. He basically said, OK, Johnny, it's yours. Go do it. Um, we should bring that back in a world where we can gather again. It was both fun and it made, you know, look, my whole view is that Judaism is supposed to be joyful, including Jewish learning. I recognize that many of us have stored up experiences of Jewish learning from our childhoods that were not joyful. Um, and one of my rabbinic uh, missions in life is to uh, replace any uh, memories of having a, a particularly harsh or abusive Hebrew school experience with something much more joyful and life affirming. Um, so yeah, let's, let's, let's think about how we can learn together as a congregation. Um, but your this, the content of your comment is also very well taken that, um, yeah, for some people, who am I first? Am I first a Jew? Um, and my considerations should first be if I am not for me, who shall be for me? Or am I first a citizen of the world? If I am not for myself, what am I? And I think that the important thing, Alan, as you point out, is that it's, it's not an either or, it's a both end. Um, I once had a friend, uh, I still have a friend who happens to be a therapist who um, taught the value of something that she calls healthy selfish, that each of us, um, that, that look, some people who are just uh, better at giving care than receiving care, and I know people who are much better at giving care than receiving care. I also know people who are better at accepting help than giving help. But she said, it's not selfish to want to take care of oneself. It, it, there is a dim dimension of behaviors that are self-oriented that are actually not only healthy, but necessary. So she refers to such things as healthy selfish. Um, it, it's my hope, for instance, that my sabbatical will be the best kind of healthy selfish. Um, it, it is, of course, self-serving. But I really, truly believe that I will be a better rabbi and better equipped to serve the community if I take the time to restore the balance and, uh, and, and to commit myself to my own spiritual growth and caretaking and learning. Um, uh, it's not if I, am for my, if I am not for myself, who shall be for me, end of statement. It's a, it's a threefold statement. And by the way, when people ask me, well, why are you taking a sabbatical right now in the middle of a pandemic? My answer is also from Hillel, if not now, when? <laughs> so, uh, Russell, your comment, please. Thank you very much. Very interested in uh, what you might, I might call the public dimension, uh, how this speaks to Jew Jews as a people. But I'm also interested in the private dimension and keep focusing in my own mind on the private dimension of this. One thing that to me, the phrase, if I'm not for myself, then, you know, then, 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 who, then who will be, is speaking of, is silently speaking of the role of conscience in our lives. You can't be for yourself and you can't take action if you know that you're wrong. And uh, similarly, I'm still very moved by his exhortation not to abuse wisdom because once again, the conscience takes a role. I hope I'm not taking up too much time if I recount a very quick anecdote, but a number of years ago, I had dinner in Munich with one of my then partners who was a German man about 10 years older than I and was born right at the end of World War II. We were talking about what our parents told us about World War II when we were growing up and what we learned about the Holocaust. And he was very categorical. And he said, my parents taught me that what Germany did was unforgivable. And the reason why it was unforgivable is that we were the heirs to the deepest and richest intellectual tradition Europe had ever known. And this is what we did with it. He said, you know, we were the grandchildren of Goethe and of Schiller and, and you know, the greatest theologians, the greatest philosophers, and this is what we did with that learning. Uh, now, one may disagree as to whether or not that is the single worst thing <laughs> that made it unforgivable, but it does suggest that moving back from the public to the private side of this, learning, wisdom are nothing without conscience. 
And my question is how often does conscience come up in the discussion of these great Jewish leaders? Well, they, I don't know if they use that word, but let's see what we can find in the forthcoming texts uh, in a few moments after I've registered a few more hands um, that speaks to the, the interior life, the life of, of human conscience um, and, and the regulating effect of conscience on human behaviors. I, I, I think you've teed up a, a fascinating lens through which to view our, our, our text this morning. Thank you, Russell. Where, what's your backdrop this morning, please? Oh, it's uh, the Presidential Palace in Santiago, Chile. For no good reason, I just felt like going there. <laughs> All right, I, I thank you for the little travelogue. Um, Mom and Dad, you have a hand up. I'm not sure when it became um, so, so universal, but in almost every synagogue, I'm going to say going back way, you know, from, from my youth, but more particularly during your education, there was always a committee, a social action committee. And it seems like the, the thrust, especially of reform Judaism, uh, as experienced in America has been towards uh, particularly social action. It's become a very important wing of, of a function that a synagogue community um, performs. And, and not to cheapen it, but, but this, this kind of three-part uh, teaching from Hillel is sort of the bumper sticker of social action, you know, how does how do you do it? Well, first you got to get involved yourself, then you got to get others involved, and do it now. That's great. You know? um, it, it surprises many people to learn that social action or social justice as a thrust of Reform Judaism is uh, not a new phenomenon, even as far back as the Pittsburgh Platform of 1885. And I think even maybe the, the Philadelphia principles that were framed by a convened group of reform rabbis in 1869 um, made efforts to acknowledge the primary place of social justice in the reform Jewish worldview and work. Um, and in fact, uh, I can find the specific language at some point, but basically the, the last of the Pittsburgh Platform's principles declares that Reform Judaism uh, decrees or believes that it is our work through the teachings of the Hebrew prophets to regulate the, um, the imbalance between, or it's, it's to, to restore uh, the world against its current orientation uh, and, and inequity. Basically, it was, a, it was a, an acknowledgement of the amassing of, of wealth by industrialists and the uh, corrosive effect on society, particularly the further marginalization of some of the most vulnerable in society and that reformed Jewish rabbis in the 1800s were actually declaring that it is our job to address that uh, faulty organization of society um, at the deepest level. So uh, although it is very much au courant um, I would say that social action as a thrust of Reform Judaism um, and as central to the Reform Jewish worldview and mission is actually um, pretty old, um, at least in America. It was not indigenous to the original Reform Jewish framing in the first half of the 19th century in Germany. Um, Nancy Siegel, a comment, please. Oh, um, but... Uh... Am I, uh, am I open? You're, you're, oh. You are not visible, but you are audible. Yeah, uh, well, it was actually from what we were talking about earlier about the self and taking care of the self. And we talked about that in the um, class the other night about the elderly and taking care of your parents and honoring. And one of the parts of that was that if you're gonna, you are taking care of the elderly, you still have to take care of yourself and that's okay. Wonderful, okay. thank you. I, I, two nights ago, I taught our uh, Melton students and the subject uh, from our Jewish ethics curriculum was on the responsibility of uh, grown children to honor their parents and particularly how one demonstrates honor for an aging parent. And a number of the texts pointed out that a person who is not taking care of oneself will not be able to give appropriate honor and care for an aging parent. It's a very poignant text, and I'm glad that you reference it in light of Hillel's comment. I think it's uh, directly applicable. And also, also, 
in reference to yourself, you've been very giving over these last months and always are giving. And I think it's essential that you take the <laughs> sabbatical now. Thank you. So that you are able to rejuvenate your own personal self because you've gone out of your way over the past months to be our wonderful rabbi teacher Thank and you friend. So well, I, I will take that comment with me as, uh, as both a, a byword and a balm. It's, it's very nice to hear. Thank you. Uh, Karen Levin. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, pretty much everything that we've just talked about, and particularly this last line, and if not now, when, has informed, and this is going to be a personal statement. Good, I want that. Informed my life since late 60s early 70s, but more so much uh, later on in my professional life and as well as my personal life, that many of these things have come together. The balance of being Jewish and the balance of knowing, being in observing other people's work, the social action, the times that I have gone and worked in the uh, international and developing world. Uh, I will just give you one statement that pulls it all together, that I have worked for the UN and I have worked for other governments in other countries, all in uh, public health and nursing. But there was this one evening that Rick Jacobs introduced me to Ruth Messenger. Hmm. The two of them had already had a conversation without telling me. And I was in the room and we were talking, the two of us, Ruth Messenger and myself, and she says, I hear about your work. How would you like to come and do all of that for a Jewish organization? And that blew me away. Amazing. Love that. And, and, and you know, that was, that is the mission of AJWS, the American Jewish World Service. It's, it's hard to, you know, um, they had a great ad campaign with uh, celebrities a few years ago explaining what the AJWS is. It is an outward facing universalistic uh, social service uh, relief organization that you know specifically works to improve the lives of some of the world's most uh, beleaguered people and communities, but does so from the perspective of Judaism and Jewish justice. So it's a beautiful blending of the Hillelian threefold maxim. And of course, its work is so urgent. I just, uh, I just gave a year end donation to AJWS. If you don't know AJWS, look up AJWS.org or view them on Charity Navigator, where they're a very, very highly rated organization for the work they do and for the way in which your dollars are directed directly to the recipient. So thank you. Ruth Messenger, one of my personal heroines. Barbara Verhaba, last comment before we dive back into text. Okay, my, it's a comment and a question. Um, were, was Hillel prosec uh, uh, prosecuted at this time and his followers, were they persecuted at this time? No, no, it's not believed that Hillel and his followers were persecuted the way that the famous 10 sages of the martyrology service on Yom Kippur who operated during Roman times were. Hillel, uh, it is believed, had m much more of a kind of free reign to teach and cultivate a class of disciples. Because it sounds to me like he's being desperate that he has to do this. Well, maybe there are... And being driven to do well, it. Well, I, I would conjecture that it's more internally driven than externally. Right, driven. yeah. Right? If not, well, I thought if he was being prosecuted at this time, then there might have been another layer of that. Yeah, I don't think so. To my knowledge, no. And it's it's a great way of thinking through the, the, the text as well. Like, what are the circumstances surrounding the teacher that prompt him to teach what he teaches? That's always right. a great question. Thank you so much. All right, so let's let's look a little bit further on. Um, we actually get to learn with Shammai now, uh, his less esteemed but not less important counterpart. Oops, sorry, that's the wrong uh, page. Uh, let me see if I can just bring up my Pirkei Avot. Here we go. Um, so Shammai is credited with the following threefold teaching. Um, Shammai used to say, Shammai Omer, Asei Torah Keva, this is Hebrew, make your Torah Keva. Now, I love that we get to look at this word again because we spent a lot of time on Keva when we were studying Mishnah Brachot over the summer and fall, right? So Keva, 
was also um, the word that was applied to that in the liturgy, that in the service of prayers, which is, sorry about that, which is fixed, right? The words on the page are the keva. The, uh, does anyone remember the name for the, uh, the kind of counterpart or complementary feature of Jewish life, Jewish prayer, Jewish activity that goes alongside keva and counterbalances it? You, it's another K sounding word. You've got keva on the one hand, and you've Kavana. got another word. Kavana. 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 Kavana means the innermost intention, right? So, but in the case of Shammai, he's not talking about Kavana. He's really talking about Ase Torah Keva. Make your Torah Keva. Or here, make uh, they put in a bracket, which I think is probably true to the intention behind the text. Make the study of Torah a fixed practice. Don't just do it when you quote unquote, have time. Um, my mentor and teacher and rabbi Les Gutterman, uh, retired uh, and emeritus rabbi of Temple Bethel in Providence, Rhode Island, once gave a wonderful sermon in which he said, I think this is a verbatim quote, he said the following, um, to find time is a dumb phrase. Time isn't lost and we don't find it. We make time and take time for the things that matter in our lives. Um, and it, it's one of those just pithy, quintessentially less Gutterman expressions that has stuck with me for the last 20 years and more. I had the privilege of being Les's assistant rabbi when I was uh, just starting out in my rabbinate in Providence between 2000 and 2003, before I came to WRT. I, I actually came to WRT with a little bit of rabbinic experience, three years of congregational rabbiing under my belt. And I'm grateful to Les for preparing me so well for the rigors of serving Scarsdale Jewry. Um, but uh, the, uh, the phrase to find time is, is not a helpful phrase, is one of those things that just constantly I catch myself correcting myself when I say, yeah, I haven't found time for that. Or I couldn't find time for that. And I correct myself and I say, actually, I did not make time for that. Because I feel like that is both intellectually more honest and spiritually more true. Uh, we always have enough time for the things that matter. And the things we don't get to are the things that don't matter. Even if we say they do, by the way. Another teacher of mine uh, once said that one should never claim that one procrastinates. Just, just admit that you lack integrity, he said. <laughs> Which I was like, come on, that's not nice. That's not fair. He said, no, think about it. Procrastination is what we say we do when something we claim matters to us, but then we don't get to it. And the point is that our actions are actually the much more accurate uh, exponent of what really matters to us in our lives, right? You do the things that matter, you do not do, or you put off the things that don't matter. And that's all you have. If you want to know what matters to you, read your calendar, because that's how you organize your time. So in the case of Shammai, perhaps he doesn't articulate all these things, but he may be aware of them, that you've got to make your own study of Torah something fixed. And this too, by the way, is that I think for rabbis specifically, along the Hillelian maxim, if I am not for myself, who shall be for me? When it comes to Torah study, um, we rabbis are only as good at teaching as we are as students, right? We have to be able to keep refilling the well if we want to be able to nourish others with Torah learning. So Shammai, I think very wisely says, make the study of Torah a fixed practice, something keva, not something you say, I'll, I'll, I'll do it when I find time. Emor me'at ve'ase harbe. Say little and do much. All right, Teddy Roosevelt might play off of that. Speak softly and carry a big stick. Your actions speak louder than words. Um, say little and do much, by the way, is most often in Jewish tradition, a phrase applied to Abraham. Um, when Abraham, Abraham and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah um, are visited in chapter 18 of the book of Genesis by three wayfarers who turn out to be divine messengers. Um, they say, oh, come in from the heat. It's the hottest time of the day. Let us bathe your feet. And they say, we will fix you a little bread. 
and water. So they promise them very little. They say, we'll just give you enough so you can get back on the road. And immediately Abraham goes to the back of the tent and instructs his household to slaughter a calf and prepare a sumptuous feast. And he directs Sarah start baking cakes. And it's this incredible smorgasbord um, for their visitors. And so the rabbis look at Abraham as the spiritual exemplar of Shammai's teaching, say little, but do much, right? Don't promise a lot. It's always better to under promise and over deliver. And finally, something we don't often associate with Shammai, um, because Shammai is often viewed as the kind of stern, dour counterpart to the gentle, friendly Hillel, uh, which is why Hillel's name ends up on the college campuses. And you know, you never have Shabbat dinner at the Shammai house. <laughs> Shabbat dinner at the Shammai house, they would promise you bread and water. At Hillel, it's like brisket and challah. Okay, so um, receive all people. I don't like all men. In this case, actually, kol adam literally means all people. Receive everyone, besever panim yafot, with a pleasant countenance. Well, again, these are kind of like Zen koans in that they start off with two phrases that make sense next to each other, um, or maybe they don't. I'm just looking for the points of connection and asking you to share what you observe in this text. What do these three things, if anything, have to do with one another? Say, uh, make your Torah study a fixed practice, speak little but do much, and receive all people with a pleasant countenance. Like, what do we do with this phrase, or is it just a hodgepodge of nice ideas? Any thoughts? Feel free to unmute yourself. Barbara, is your mic still unmuted from before, or do you have a new Yeah, it's comment? unmuted. Okay. So let's see if anyone else has a new comment to share on the wisdom of Shammai. Um, maybe, can I start? Would you please? Maybe if you, you study on a regular basis and you absorb what you're studying, that you might be more pleasant to those you encounter that it, you would absorb enough of teachings in Torah to be sort of decent human being that uh, you could approach all people with a, you know, pleasant countenance or, you know, in good spirit. Nice. Can I say something from the teaching perspective? Um, my, there were, there were teachers who are know their subject they get it across to the kids, but do they really get it across to the kids? I know some of my students used to come and say another teacher, she doesn't like me. And I said, what are you talking about? She, she, she just, I know she doesn't like me. I know those kids weren't learning as much as she knew and as much as she taught. She didn't, they didn't perceive her as liking them. And just a little self aggrandizement there was once an ESL student who was writing in his composition book. Um, I really am very happy in Mrs. Gross's class. She smiles at me. Mm. And I think teaching with a smile and um, being, having a friendly face projects something that gets, you get rewarded back. The learning comes back to you. Huh? You know you've done your job. Um, because those those students um, have ex not only accepted your your facility, what you know about your subject, but but they've um, they've absorbed it in ways that they wouldn't if you come with an angry face. Judy, I, I so completely agree with you. I just want to, and I'm reflecting more personally than through any uh, wisdom or specific wisdom that I might have from Judaism. Uh, my own experience as a teacher is what corroborates your point of view in, in me. Um, I will say that, look, I think we've all had teachers who are hard in the sense of difficult. And at least in my experience, the teachers in my life who have mattered the most to me have almost uniformly been very hard, very challenging teachers because they pushed me to learn and excel and challenge assumptions and refine and make my thinking more rigorous. And we've also had teachers who are hard in the sense of mean, right? They're just hard people, hardened. And that's not good as a teacher. 
in my view, you want to be hard in the sense of difficult as a teacher. You never want to keep the bar too low because then there's no sense of accomplishment. And frankly, people get bored. I always assume that my learners are eager to elevate themselves and challenge themselves to learn. Um, and that some of the joy actually comes through the striving. But I, I've learned over the years to be much less hard in the sense of mean or stern. Um, and I think that this is an area where I have had to grow and, 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 and always still trying to grow as a teacher. That even when I am frustrated, aggravated, depleted, stressed out, I don't want to bring that into the classroom because the overriding consideration for me is what am I trying to do when I'm teaching? I am trying to create joyful Judaism um, because I believe that at its root, Judaism is a joyful tradition. And if only more people had a joyful association with Judaism, we'd have a lot more people caring about being Jewish and transmitting the tradition to the next generation. So ultimately, my success or failure rides on my ability and the ability of the temple and my team and and the congregation, frankly, to uh, approach Judaism with joy. Um, so that if it's clear that I'm having fun when I'm teaching, it's going to just be a better class experience for everyone else. Um, and, and I've learned that that's much more important than people mastering the intricacies of Midrash or Talmud or Mishnah study. Uh, you'll get that along the way, but you'll get it better if we're all having fun doing it. Um, and it's, sometimes we take our work at the temple so damn seriously that we forget it's duty is supposed to be fun. Um, so, uh, so thank you. And, and by the way, I would add, I think you've unlocked a possible key to understanding how the three statements of Shammai connect. I'll put them back on the screen so that we can all observe this. Um, they don't make a whole lot of sense as general aphorisms, general bywords. Okay, make you the study of Torah fixed practice. Fine, that's great. Great idea. Thank you, Shammai. Speak little but do much. Another great but totally unrelated concept. Okay. And receive all people with a pleasant countenance. A still a third unrelated concept. Except if you assume that the recipient of Shammai's wisdom is a teacher in training. And then you think about, and again, I think it was my dad who said this is a manual for the teachers, right? This is chapter one of Pirkei Avot is the roadmap to how to be a good teacher of Torah. Then if you're looking at this as what are the three most important thing for a things for a teacher of Torah to know, then these make sense as a unit, right? In, in fact, if I were saying to a, a young rabbinical student, what are the three most important things if you want to become a master teacher of Torah? One, make your own study of Torah fixed practice. Absolutely. I would say that would be number one. I would say speak little but do much. In other words, you're a teacher of Torah through your actions. You need to live Torah and exemplify Torah even more than your words, right? Of course, we want, we want our teachers to be eloquent, but you won't be believable unless you are actually living a life of Torah. So let your actions speak louder than your words and what I just said about joyful Judaism. Go in there happy, be happy to teach. These are really solid threefold guide uh, word for specifically for teachers of Torah. Let's move on. You notice now that we have a little bit of a break in the, in the format or the flow of Pirkei Avot chapter one and that this is the first time in, in 16 units, uh, 16 Mishnayot or 16 compact teachings where we do not say such and so learned from them, right? That has been from section one all the way through 15. It's been a group or a person teaches the disciple, the disciple or the pair of disciples teaches the next line and down the ladder. Um, now we come to uh, one Rabban Gamliel and I'll say a word in a moment about who this guy was because there are actually two Rabban Gamliels which it gets very confusing. Rabban Gamliel Haya Omer. Haya Omer is used to say. So Rabban Gamliel used to say, Aselecha Rav, this is a repeat. Um, get yourself or appoint yourself a teacher, literally make for yourself a teacher, designate somebody as your teacher. Let's see where that was above. Uh, here it is, uh, uh, number six, Yehoshua ben Parachia, Venitai, the Arbalite. 
uh, he used to say, Joshua ben Paracha used to say, so it's the same thing here, but a couple of generations later, Rabban Gamliel used to say, make yourself a teacher. Now, is he just repeating the wisdom of his forebear? Possibly. Or do we have a well-known rabbinic aphorism, make yourself or get yourself a teacher, that is ascribed to two different rabbis at two different points in Jewish tradition, two, two different timelines in Jewish history, because the rabbis aren't sure who it should be attributed to, or there are multiple traditions about who actually said it first. I'm open to all those possibilities. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter much. The hista lake min hasafek, distance yourself from doubt. Hista lake min hasafek, avoid doubt. We'll talk about what that might mean. The al tarbe la aser at, uh, uh, omadot, and do not make a habit of tithing by guesswork. Okay, another one of these weird threefold, what the hell does, wh which of these things does not belong? How do these things connect? Rabban Gamla used to say, appoint yourself a teacher, avoid doubt, and do not tithe abstractly. Omadot, don't make your tithes a matter of guesswork. Anyone want to take a crack at what the hell is happening in this text here? It's it's a weird one. I'll, I'll admit that. Take a moment to ruminate. Your thoughts, feelings will all count if you want to register them. Uh, just a question. What is tithing? Great. Um, so tithing is uh, a requirement all the way back from the Torah. So using some language we've already uh, picked up in this class, uh, this is deoraita law in Aramaic. The word deoraita means from the Torah. So the Torah instructs in the book of Leviticus that before a person eats his produce, he has to give two tithes. The first tithe, which is a presumably a 10% tax goes to the Levitical household. And the second tithe either is supposed to be brought to Jerusalem during the first, second, fourth, and fifth years of the sabbatical cycle. So you have a seven year cycle um, in which agriculture was tithed. And every year a person is responsible for giving up a 10% donation of one, excuse me, of the produce that one grows. Um, in the first, second, fourth, and fifth years out of seven, you're supposed to bring your tithe, your temp like, you know, wheelbarrows full of grain or produce, whatever, as well as tithes on your flocks and herds to the temple in Jerusalem, where it would be consumed. In the third and sixth years, the tithe would be given to the poor. And in the seventh year, you're not growing and therefore you're not tithing. So Rabban Gamliel is basically saying that you should not make estimates when you tithe, but rather make sure that your tithes are precise, which by the way, has a kind of logical connection to the previous statement, which is one should avoid doubt. Um, though in the later commentary, and I'll just share this with you since I don't see a, a great abundance of hands going up, though some of you may wish to talk. Um, in, in the ancient world, remember we talked about this last time that the rabbi job in antiquity was a twofold uh, career. You were both judge of matters of Jewish law and practice, and you were a teacher of the law. Um, and so remember that Pirkei Avot, even though we kind of, we may have just done like a, 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 like a, a quick swerve, a left turn away from the last few texts, which were all about rabbi as teacher and the character attributes that we wish to uh, have inform a rabbi. Don't forget that last week we spent most of our time on rabbi as judge. So they're both still floating in Pirkei Avot chapter one. If you read the thing in sequence, if you don't spread it out over five or six weeks like we have, you might be able better to detect this. I think that these particular teachings associated um, with Rabban Gamliel, who by the way is still um, living before the time of Jesus, this is the first Rabban Gamliel, the less famous Rabban Gamliel. There are two Rabban Gamliels. And it's interesting, he's the first one to have the title of Rabban, which is similar to 
uh, Rav, which means rabbi, or Rabbi, which means my teacher. Rabban means the teacher. So we've got the teacher named Gamliel, the original. Um, he says uh, that perhaps this is more about the rabbinic role or the, the role of the rabbi as judge, right? Do not, you have to remove yourself from doubt when you are adjudicating a matter of law. And again, there's no difference between Jewish law and secular law. This is Jewish law. It's, there's no separation of church and state. So your role as rabbi is to investigate cases with such a thoroughness and attention to detail that you will not bring, you will remove doubt from the consideration before you can render an appropriate judgment. And that also applies to your personal conduct, right? When you are tithing, which is something that everyone was expected to do, you, especially as the rabbi, as the judge for the community, should not be doing any of this by guesswork. Now, what does that have to do with the first part of the text, which again is the repetition of get yourself a teacher? Not quite sure. Again, this could simply be a secondary attribution so that the rabbis who are writing the Mishnah say, actually, we have this prevailing tradition that it was Rabbi Joshua ben Parachia who said, appoint for yourself a teacher. And then there's another tradition that says it was Rabbi Gamliel the first, the OG Gamliel, <laughs> literally OG, um, who said, appoint for yourself a teacher. The commentators, the later rabbis point out that the way one avoids doubt in judicial proceeding is by having a good teacher. I think it's a bit of a stretch. They say, how are you going to make yourself a successful rabbinic adjudicator of law, you need a good rabbi yourself. Now, I will share personally at this moment. As a rabbi, it's very important for me to have rabbis who can help me adjudicate matters of Jewish practice when I'm out of my depth. So a recent case presented itself exactly a year ago. It was like a year and change. Um, I was uh, summoned to perform a graveside funeral, a, a burial, or it was actually a funeral in our sanctuary, followed by uh, a burial up in Valhalla, not the Viking Hall of the Dead, but rather Valhalla, New York, AKA North White Plains, where all the Jewish cemeteries are. And I get to the cemetery and the cemetery staff informs me, Rabbi, we've got a problem. I say, what's the problem? Well, we dug into the grave to bury Mrs. So-and-so and there's a boulder there that we think is about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. I say, okay, well, what does that mean? They say, well, it means we can't bury Mrs. So-and-so today. And I said, oh, that's not good. Um, I say, what would you like to do? They say, well, we wanna put her in a crypt temporarily in a mausoleum and hold her uh, until we can get a crew out to blast the boulder with dynamite and free up the grave and then come back. And I said, when will that be? They say, not before Monday. It's now Friday at two o'clock. And it's the time of year where the sun is setting around 4.30. So we've got, to, and cemeteries don't stay open past three on Fridays anyway in the Jewish world. Cemeteries are all union labor. They have very strict rules about when they will be there for you and when they will not. Of course, you can have a burial whenever you like for the right sum of money, um, even on Christmas day. Just telling you, this is some inside baseball on burials. Um, that's just the way it is, folks. Um, so um, I say, I'm not sure I like that. It, it turns out that the family that we were trying to comfort, um, half of the family affiliated reform and half affiliated conservative. So half of the family, like, Half of the children of the deceased belong to Temple Israel and half of them belong to WRT. I mentioned that because I said, I can't tell this family that they can't begin Shiva, right? So if you know Jewish law, you know that Shiva starts um, at the time of burial, not at the time of the funeral. We've had the funeral, but now we're talking about when is the, when is the burial going to take place? Well, if the burial is not till Monday, then I have to tell this family that they can't sit Shiva until Monday at the earliest. I said, that's not gonna play very well. So I did what uh, Rabban Gamliel advises. I got myself a teacher and I called my Orthodox rabbi friend, Jonathan Morgenstern. And I said, here's the, and he picked up right away. I said, here's the deal. 
Um, and I, I he, he's, and this is why I'm teaching this now. This is not just a digression. I was hoping I would have the opportunity to share this story today. He said, I'm so happy you called. Give me a few minutes. I've got to call my guy. That's literally what he said. This is the rabbi of young Israel of Scarsdale. I said, so, and I, I said, okay, how soon can you call me back? He says, if he's around, I'll call you right back. I said, okay. Meanwhile, we're standing out there in the cold waiting to figure out what the hell we're going to do with poor Mrs. So-and-so who just wants to be buried. Um, he calls me back 10 minutes later. He says, I spoke to my guy. Who's his guy? It was his rabbi, of course. So I called a rabbi because I needed to remove doubt from what the scenario was. The funeral home and the, uh, the cemetery knows some Jewish law, but they don't know all the intricacies. So I called an Orthodox rabbi. He called his professor at Yeshiva University, his guy, his like master teacher on matters of Jewish law. He said, what do you do? He said, here's what you do. You're gonna do what's called a Kavura al Tanai, which literally means a provisional burial. He says the halacha, the Jewish law provides that if for some reason of physical obstruction, a person cannot be buried in a designated grave. He said, Rabbi Morgenstern says to me, is there another grave belonging to this family nearby? I said, I asked the question, I said, yes, they have a family plot. There are actually six unoccupied graves surrounding it. They say, can you open a different grave temporarily? Yes, the family was amenable to that. So of course they wanted Mrs. So-and-so next to Mr. So-and-so who had died and been buried a year before. But for the time being, they opened a different grave, the one at Mr. So-and-so's feet, not by his side. And they say, dig the grave just deep enough to cover the casket, like not six feet deep. It'll take 20 minutes, 30 minutes most. Dig a shallow trench, put the casket in the grave, perform the burial service, do all of the prayers, do all of the things, spill some earth onto it. Just make sure that the lid of the casket is slightly below flush with the ground so that you can cover it with a thin layer of earth and then go have Shabbos and the family can enter Shiva. And then he said, when you get the crew back to the cemetery to blast the rock out with dynamite, he said, I was so touched that you called me, this is Rabbi Morgenstern now, and that you asked for my opinion on this, that I will personally come to the grave with the family to supervise the exhuming and reinterment of the casket in the proper grave next week. He also knew that Monday's my day off. I said, you don't have to do that. He said, it would be my kavod, it would be my honor. Um, and that's exactly what happened. We did a provisional burial on Friday afternoon. The family observed Shiva in the timeline that they were hoping to. Um, the crew came out, they blasted a boulder the size of a Volkswagen Beetle out of the ground on Monday morning. Monday at noon, Rabbi Morgenstern went back with the family. They knew who he was because they've seen him at Tashlich and other community events. And thank God he's a known figure and beloved as well. Um, and he presided over the reinterment ceremony, which was another 10 minutes on Monday afternoon. Um, and that's a real life story that I think uh, actually applies the teaching of Rabban Gamliel with the exception of the business about tithing. Get yourself a teacher so that you can remove doubt from your rabbinic practice. Um, so in other words, I don't think it's necessarily only an abstract or a, a mindless connection or a random connection among these principles. Thank you for the 10 minutes it took me to share that anecdote. Someday when I write my memoir, that story will have a, a prominent place because I think it's a beautiful illustration of both the absurdities of the real life rabbinate. <laughs> Sometimes you just, you just, you know, you, you can be a rabbi for 20 years and there's still stuff that you've never seen before and you don't know what to do. And what do you do in those moments? Who are you gonna call? You call your rabbi, call your rabbi so that you don't have to do something and say, hmm, I wasn't sure of the law. I made my best guess. This is all about, remember how uh, much the rabbis in Pirkei Avot emphasize the relational aspect for the teacher student, right? It's that the master student or the student disciple, or the teacher disciple relationship permeates rabbinic life. 
And that even when you have been a rabbi for decades and decades and decades, rabbis still need rabbis. Final thought. Earlier today, Rabbi, uh, rabbi Markowitz, <laughs> Alan Markowitz mentioned Rabbi Jan Katsu as one of the teachers in his breakout group at Yomi Mood, our day of learning several years ago. Well, I've mentioned already today, Les Gutterman is my rabbi. Well, Jan Katsu was also my rabbi. And during my sabbatical, I have a weekly study set up with him. And we sit down together and we study Talmud together. And it's one of the great joys of my life to have his friendship and his mentorship. And sometimes we find ourselves digressing and, you know, talking about work and life and family. And then we make our way back into the text. And it's just so much better than trying to learn this alone. Um, Russell, your hand. Well, thank you for sharing those, those stories. Uh, you had asked uh, if we see a connection between the two exhortations, one to find a teacher and the other uh, to be accurate in one's accounting. Uh, and I do see a connection. Uh, I, I read the, the admonition uh, to not over tithe. In other words, saying don't, it shouldn't, it shouldn't only come from the heart. It uh, shouldn't come from guesswork. You need to be intentional about what you do and you need to be accurate because after all, if you do it by instinct and you overpay in this period, then you might be underpaying in other periods. And ultimately nobody's going to trust that this is actually part of a higher system. And this is part of a, a, a higher level of intentionality. And to me, that is related to finding a teacher. Uh, uh, it, it, is, it is a reminder that there is always more to learn. There is always deeper to go. There is always another lesson. And if you're simply going to do things by instinct, uh, it's not going to lead you to that better place. Beautiful. Thank you. Yasha Koach. So um, let's, let's plug forward because I think we can actually, uh, I think we can finish Pirkei Avot chapter one today. Um, so we're going to learn with Rabbi uh, Shimon Ben Gamliel now. Oops. Uh, Shimon Ben Gamliel, as the name seems to indicate, is Simon, the son of Gamliel. Um, and it even says so in the text here. Sorry, I haven't put the share screen up properly. Here we go. Um, so Shimon Ben Gamliel, Shimon Beno, literally Simon, his son, Omer, used to say, Kol yamai gadalti ven hachachamim. All of my days I have grown up among the sages. Velo matsati la guf tov ela shtika. And if I have found nothing better for a person, literally it says nothing is better for the body. The guf is the body. Goof is a great word in that it's a false cognate with the English word goof. <laughs> goof, gimel vav fe, goof is your body. Nothing is better for your physical health, elashtika, than silence. And in the next part of the teaching, velo amidrash hu ha'ikar, and study is not the most important thing. And notice the word for study here is midrash. Deep exploration of text is not the most important thing. Ela hamase, rather actions, one's deeds. Vechol hamar be devarim, and anyone who multiplies words, mevichet, is going to cause transgression. Here they have brings about sin. So I'll repeat it and then I'll shut up because I don't want to violate the spirit of the text. All of my days I have grown up among the sages. And I have found nothing better for a person than silence, which is a hilarious comment, by the way, if you think about it, right? I have spent my whole day with rabbis. Now, folks, I've spent a lot of time with rabbis. You know, in a year where there's not a pandemic going on, I might spend a few days with 500 rabbis in a, you know, hotel in some American city at the annual Reform Rabbi Convention. Let me tell you, it is not a silent environment, right? This is not like a monastery where we take a vow of shutting up for three days. <laughs> Rabbis like to talk. So just appreciate that there might be some humor interthreaded here that you just got to think about it. So Shimon Ben Gamliel, who's the son of this prominent teacher, says, look, I've spent my whole time around rabbis, and what I think is most valuable in life is silence. Don't multiply your study, but just do the deeds. And if you talk too much, 
you're just going to create a mess. <laughs> so I find this to be a very funny text. What are your thoughts, Dad? Oh, unmute yourself, please. There you I go. was wondering if you could just unpack the word uh, from the Hebrew, Baha'i Kar. Great. Which I, which I, which I remember from Hayi Kar Lola Fahed Kalal. Yeah, exactly. From Reb Nachman of Bratislav is famous yeah. for saying, Kol ha'olam, Kol ha'olam Kulo, the entire world, Gesher Tsar Meod is a very narrow bridge. The Ha'ikar and the essence, the essential thing. Okay, Ikar means the kernel. The Ikar is the essence of a thing. There's a wonderful spiritual Jewish community out in Los Angeles led by my friend and former co-counselor at Jewish camp, Ramah in the Berkshires, uh, Rabbi Sharon Brous. Look her up. She's an all-star. You've probably read her, seen her, heard of her. She's made like that Newsweek top 50 rabbis list in America again and again and again. Her community in LA is called Ikar, the essence. So all my days I've grown up and I have found that uh, there's nothing better than silence. Velo midrash hu ikar. And when it comes to life or rabbinic life specifically, study is not the thing, is not the kernel. It's not the ikar, rather action is. Uh, Rabbi Nachman said, sorry. So the entire world is, is a very narrow bridge. Veha ikar and the essence, the essential thing, lo lefached kalal, is not to be afraid. The entire world is a narrow bridge, and the essential matter is that we are not afraid, or one should not be afraid. Great teaching. Thank you for, for recollecting a 19th century Hasidic rabbi whose comments are, or 18th century Hasidic rabbi whose comments are most germane. Other thoughts or comments on Shimon ben Gamliel? Yes, I have one. Great, Carol, please. Well, if you grow up among the sages or the rabbis and you say they all like to talk, you don't have time to, to talk. You just listen and you'll learn from all of the talking. Great. That's a more optimistic appraisal of life among the rabbis, I think, than I offered. But yes. I just wonder how all this applies to that very small cemetery in Prague where the graves are tumbled over the one before and the one before and the one before and what kind of challenges that I was in Prague at that time had to allow this to happen and what kind of a discussions they must have had along the lines of not being afraid for instance mm. um, getting proper authority maybe not from a single rabbi but from the collective because as I understand it, that grave site was all there was. They couldn't expand it. They didn't find anything else. And of course, it is a major tourist attraction. But the, what, what you raised in my mind, and I've been there very often as I work there, is what stands behind for this unique site to be allowed and existing, and I just have to say, it must be the community of rabbis who decided together, not one, not two, but all of them, because they, they had to defend their actions. Hmm. So how does it relate to Yeah, that? it's, it's a, is that a comment on the, the primacy of action over word? It is to me, one of the primacy of action over words, but it is also where a community of highly educated spiritual leaders get together and decide that the spirituality has to be extended to where the practical uh, restrictions take over. Thank you. I don't know how it relates to this. So um, any other uh, thoughts or comments on this one? Let's. Uh, somebody wrote, this is Michelle Braun, thank you for your comment in the chat window. I like Shimon Ben Gamliel. Well, so do I. Uh, as a newbie analyst, and you mean yourself, not Shimon, I assume, um, I was taken to a meeting uh, with a big, big, big boss, uh, VC of the vice chair of the board, associated with the work that I did. This, I'm reading Michelle's words here. It never occurred to me to say anything. After the meeting, my boss said that I'd done great. I questioned this, so he clarified that newbies usually feel compelled to show off and then they get cut down. 
Yeah, right? Say little, do much. Just, and I think that there is most certainly a sense of hierarchy within the rabbinical community that your role as disciple, your role as learner is to sit at the feet of the sages and absorb. Just don't talk so much. <laughs> the, the time for talking will come. On that note, let's tackle our last text, the 18th section or the 18th passage in chapter one, and then we are off to Hanukkah. And interestingly enough, there's a quote from the prophet Zechariah in this text, who is also the prophet for the Haftarah of the Sabbath in between the eight or during the eight days of Hanukkah. So Zechariah is the prophet who speaks of a vision of a golden candelabra with multiple branches that are lit, which is why it's read on Hanukkah. Okay, I'm not sure that that's so meaningful to all of us, but here we go. Um, so, and by the way, remember that I said that the Mishnah tends to end each chapter on something of a nechemta, a word of comfort or a more elevated note. So Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, the same guy, right? So we're at the, we're still in the kind of pre-generations before the rabbinic community. He's still Rabban, I guess it's a proto-rabbinic title. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel Omer used to say, Al shlosha devarim ha'olam omed. If that is a familiar phrase, it's because you know it from the song, Al shlosha devarim. But we also, just jarring your memory, we looked at it way up above. Shimon the righteous, a different Shimon, different Simon, one of the earlier Shimons, who's centuries before the common era, the last of the men of the great assembly. So we're talking like fourth, fifth century BCE, fourth century BCE. He used to say, Al shlosha devarim ha'olam omed. The world stands on three things. Al ha-Torah, ve al ha'avodah, ve al gemilut chasadim. On Torah, temple service or worship or servitude or fealty to God, not clear what, exactly what that means. The al gemilut chasadim and deeds of piety, loving acts, acts of loving kindness. Now, the other Shimon, and this is almost certainly a deliberate loop or envelope back to the earlier text. So early after the preamble, remember, if you just look at the architecture of the whole chapter now, we start with Moses transmitted the Torah at Sinai down to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, elders to the prophets, etc. That's the preamble. That's just like introductory language. The first main teaching in Pirkei Avot is the world stands on three things. Al HaTorah, the Al HaAvodah, the al gemilut chasadim, on Torah, temple service, and acts of piety. Now the last teaching in Pirkei Avot chapter one loops us back to the first as a way of creating closure, creating an envelope. Rabban Shimon Shima ben Gamliel Omer, al shlosha devarim haolam omed, the world stands on three things, not Torah, avodah, gemilut chasadim. Listen to what he says. Al hadin, on justice, the al ha emet, truth, the al ha shalom, and on peace. Justice, truth, peace, and the American way. No, there's no American way. And then the unusual feature that acts as kind of like the coda or the elevating spiritual remark to conclude a chapter of Mishnah is there's a biblical quote. You notice that this is not normative in Mishnah. Generally, when the rabbis make a point, issue a teaching, they don't cite a biblical source, occasionally, but it's not the main Mishnaic way of talking, but here it is at the end of the chapter, and I think that's significant. From Zechariah chapter 8, emet umishpat shalom shiftu b'sha'arechem, bring about or execute the judgment of truth and peace in your settlements, in your gate. B'sha'arechem literally means in your gates, but it means within all the places you dwell. So you shall bring forth truth, justice, and peace in your gates, in your communities. Emet mishpat shalom, or here, as they are given uh, synonyms, al hadin vi al ha emet vi al shalom. The world stands on three qualities: justice, truth, and peace. Why, wherefore, what's, what's happening here? What, 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 does, what do these three qualities bring into the world? 
What do they have to do with everything we've read before? And your chance to talk. Justice, truth, and peace. Why is that the final note of this chapter? And now you've got to think back about the whole chapter, everything we've been talking about, the master-disciple relationship, the primacy of the roles of teacher and judge for rabbis, the development of an appropriately humble character and pleasant disposition as core attributes of the rabbinate. Kit or Bob, do you want to share a comment, please? No, I just want to wish everybody a happy Hanukkah. Happy so Hanukkah to you. Thank you. Other thoughts on justice, truth, and peace? Uh, Ivan, your hand is up. Yes, I, well, it is a common denominator in everything else that we, that we learn. There is that element of justice, peace, and truth. And it applies in so many different ways in the modern world, just the same. They are truly these three pillars on which you can build a life. And the rest is commentary. That's my Thank take. you. Yeah, beautifully said that this is actually a kind of let's zoom the lens out, not zoom as in the application we're using on the internet. Let's zoom out. Let's stop focusing on the very, very small granular details. Let's look at what the rabbinic project is really all about. It's about creating a world that is God's realm. So again, it's very easy to kind of focus on the minutiae because the rabbis focus on the minutia. But at the very end of the chapter, there's this lovely widening of the lens and saying, wait a minute, what is the rabbinic project writ large? It is actually to create a world perfected under God's rule. And that world is a world that is founded on universal principles of justice, truth, and peace, the biggest possible, as opposed to al ha Torah, al ha Avodah, the al Gimilud Chasadim, which are particularistic Jewish uh, pursuits, right? The pursuit of Torah, of worship, Jewish worship, and Gimilud Chasadim, acts of Jewish piety. That is the particularistic. But at the end of the text, we come around full circle. It's the same formula. It's the same syntax. It's similar vocabulary. But the three precepts that are going to be uh, lifted up for the reader, for the student, are the largest possible concepts and, I think, aspirations of the rabbinic project, right? What are we rabbis actually here to do? We are here to create a new world. We are here to rebuild God's creation at a time of stress and political upheaval and Messiah's promised but false, and all the things that we know about the incredibly tumultuous times in which these teachers lived, the rabbis of the mission are saying, truth, justice, and peace. That's what our work is about. The way in which we do it may be very specific and very particularistic to Jewish norms, but at the end of the day, the Jewish project, not just the rabbinic project, the Jewish project is about fashioning a world made anew in the image of God. It's a very grandiose mission. When people ask me, what is the mission of Westchester Reform Temple? When I'm feeling my most grandiose, I will say to model a world perfected. Now, look, you can say that's outrageous. That's, that's a ridiculous idea. How could one synagogue model a perfect world? I say, well, that's what we do. The whole idea of a synagogue is to model a perfect world. Because the idea is that if you do that in your synagogue, it gets translated out into the messy world beyond the walls of the synagogue. Your thoughts. Arlene, a comment from you, please. Oh, just unmute yourself, please. You are still muted. <laughs> they used to let rabbis unmute people. Now, nope, you're still muted. Let me try this. Don't, don't tap anything. Hang on. I've just asked you to unmute. Now you should be able to respond on your screen. Maybe. No problem. Perfect. I'm on an iPad, which is a little bit different. Yes, I know. Okay. I, I think that these goals are universal, not just pertaining to Judaism. And many of the things that we've hit upon today and in the previous sessions 
are universal. Universal goals, and especially during this time in our world, each one of these things is so critical for our existence on a daily basis. Beautiful. And that's why, by the way, I gave much of our time this morning to the Hillel Maxim. I spent, I wanted to really have an expansive conversation around if I am not for myself, who shall be for me? If I am right. for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? Because that's not just about, as I think Alan and others pointed out, that's not just about the individual self. That's about the Jew and the world, mm -hmm. the, the particular interests of the group, one's group, yeah. and the everyone. Uh, beautifully put, Arlene. Anything else that anyone would like to add? Well, I can't think of a more inspired or inspiring way to go out that, that note of what are we really here to do? We're here to create a more perfect world, one founded on truth, justice, and peace. Um, may this be God's will. Um, may the lights of Hanukkah be an emblem of that mission. Uh, so tonight and over the course of the eight days to come that we are lighting Hanukkah flames and putting those flames visibly in the window. Um, it's, it, it's no good if you're just hiding your menorah away. Um, it's supposed to be a public demonstration of light at the darkest time of the year. Let's remember that our mission as a community is to bring more justice, more truth, and more shalom into a hurting yes. world. Um, amen, amen. Amen. It's amen. been a blessing to study with you. Please uh, f get yourself a Pirkei Avot, study as much as you like, get yourself a teacher, acquire a companion, continue to learn, and I can't wait to see you, uh, well, I can't wait to see you over the next eight days. We have a number of signups still available for in-person Hanukkah menorah lightings outdoor at, at outdoors at the temple. And more online activity, I'll be joining a family yoga class that you are all welcome to join. No yoga skill required, four o'clock this Saturday over Zoom. That's in the weekly newsletter. I'll also be leading with Kelly a Havdalah from our living room on the 19th. So a week from Saturday after Hanukkah concludes, join us for a sweet little 15, 20 minute musical Havdalah moment where we can all give thanks for the uh, having survived uh, thus far. And we'll say a little Shehechianu together. That's on the 19th at five o'clock. And please join us at the end of the month for a meaningful and stirring conversation with Mr. Abdullah Shaheen, who is the Consul General of the United Arab Emirates uh, based in New York. Uh, he's a diplomat with the UAE Embassy in Washington, who will hold forth with our entire Westchester Jewish community on the improving ties between the Gulf states and the UAE specifically and Israel. Um, that's the 29th of December, which is a Tuesday at one o'clock. All this and more is in your weekly yeah. e-blast. So don't ignore it. Chag Sameach, everyone. Happy Hanukkah. And uh, Chag Sameach. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Diane. Bye-bye.